Hello, Diamond listeners, and welcome to the Crystallized Life Podcast, where we aim to help individuals learn how to reach their highest potential, not according to the world standard, but God's ideal plans for our lives. I am Dr. Crystal Lewis, and today I have a special guest with me. She is a part of my family, and she is my friend. So today I welcome our Diamond listeners to Mrs. Renee Kratom. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Diamond listeners, I love it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mrs. Renee Kratom. I'm just so thankful and excited that you are a part of this podcast, and I cannot wait to hear the great nuggets that you have in store for us. Thank you so, for having me, Crystal. Awesome. Great. So we're going to just get into it. I'm going to do a brief interview, just a brief introduction rather on you. Um, as I mentioned before, she is Mrs. Renee Kratom. She's a mental health provider, a Christian woman, a wonderful wife, mother, and a great friend. She champions and advocates for mental health change. Currently, she is the founder of Renee K lcsw.com, which is a virtual mental health company that provides therapy to individuals, couples, and families. So once again, welcome, Mrs. Kratom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So let's just get right mm -hmm. into it. Um, right now, the state of our world, we've really been in quite a difficult time, mm -hmm. not really, not only in the US, but also all around the globe, um, really been taken by storm with this pandemic, COVID-19. Um, and there's just so much grief, anxiety, and stress in the world. Um, I wanna know, what are what is your advice for counselors in this time? There's a lot of telehealth happening right now. Uh, what is your advice for counselors that are really trying to also release from the baggage that they're listening to from their patients? Um, at this moment, you know, the pandemic just didn't hit us physically, but there was the mental component that came with it. Um, and then there's going to be a mental component after. We're going to see an increase in PTSD, um, major depressive disorder, anxiety levels are, are rising. So I'm seeing a lot of patients that have, um, that meet the markers for those um, disorders. For a provider, for a therapist, anyone who's within the mental health um, community, I would say it is the best time. We always say a therapist need a therapist, but literally this is the time that you need that therapist and you need that to um, unload to give some perspective of what you're doing and where you're headed. Right now, for me, I'm in a support group. <laughs> I am in a support group for um, psychiatrists, psychologists, and um, LCSWs, anyone within the, um, that does counseling. So I'm a part of that group. And every Thursday at two o'clock, I'm I'm looking forward to it because I know through the week I've had to, to deal with, with these issues and, and maybe I'm, I'm fatigued. There's this thing called compassion fatigue. And it happens to individuals who are within the helping community where we feel like I don't have it. Mm. I can't give it right now. Right. Uh, I, I, and, and we don't want to get to that place because then um, behaviors and change becomes normal, right? Things are not, not necessarily change, but, but these maladaptive behaviors that we're seeing within our patients become normal and we're not really willing to, or we don't know how to advise them at that moment. So I would say for the mental health providers, you need to speak to someone. Form a, it, it might not necessarily be a mental health provider itself, but have a supportive friend to say, listen, this is what I need from you in this moment. Mm -hmm. This is what I need from you. I need for you to listen to um, to me in regards to work. And I'm not breaking any confidentiality, but I might say something like, oh my gosh, I had this patient and, you know, they're dealing with so much and, and unloading in a way that you can now do your job effectively. Everyone needs to unload. 
Wow, that's so interesting that you say that, that a therapist also needs a therapist. Absolutely. I, I think sometimes, you know, we may think that everyone has it all together, whether it's a therapist or a pastor. Oftentimes we think that, you know, they have it all together and they yeah. have all the answers. But it's really interesting that you say that's really important to have a support system. Absolutely. And, and to go even further, you know, I think... Um, the two professions, and I'm, I might be bit biased, right? But being a therapist and a pastor, you have these expectations um, of being perfect and happy all the time and flawless. And these expectations aren't necessarily put on by you. It's put on by other people, what other people's expectation of your career mm. is. And what happens is in that moment, we interject that into ourselves and we're trying to live to that expectation that's unattainable where where it says perfection and flawless and because we can't get there now our anxieties become um triggered mm. we're, we're we're looking to fulfill other people's expectations of us and sometimes you know we just have to say you know what i'm sad I, I'm, I'm able to say that I'm sad or I'm happy because, and, and, and I think this might be a, um, a, my statement for this podcast right now, that our emotions and feelings are not linear. Mm. It's not linear. And because it's not linear, understand that I'm going to have movement. And um, today I might be happy. And in this moment, I might feel really good. But I might have been triggered by something on the news, something someone said, whatever it may be. And I might take a dip. I might take a dip. Um, and that's okay. And that's okay. We, we have to normalize these these attitudes and feelings of sadness because they occur and it's okay. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because I think oftentimes it's so difficult to get there where mm -hmm. you're then able to actually be real with yourself and identify how you are feeling right then and there in the moment. Um, what are some things that you have done to identify what you're feeling at the time that you're feeling it is it something that you've practiced over time? Is there a process to doing this? Mm -hmm. It is definitely, it comes with the territory. And when I first started, you know, everyone wants to be the best and, mm -hmm. and, and, and champion just have these um, goals of changing everyone that comes into um, your practice or changing everyone that you, mm -hmm. you may connect with. And you, you realize that the change that occurs might not just be that person, but might also be you. Mm -hmm. And that change might be, I need to be a little bit more compassionate to my patients. I need to be a little bit more understanding. I might need to be a little bit more assertive. Mm -hmm. um, and I might need time to decompress from every session that I do so I can have a moment of clarity uh, a moment of focus where the next person that comes into my office will receive my 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 attention the same way that last patient have so i think it's 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 um it's a work in progress and that progress is never ending um mm -hmm. Well, when we think about all these goals that people may have, when I started this, um, I had these big dreams and big goals of the type of therapist I would want to be. And I forgot to put in there in the mix, disappointment, mm -hmm. setbacks, anxiety, depression, faith, and hope. When we're setting these goals, we forget to put those things, disappointment, anxiety, and depression. We forget. We all, we, we think it's just something perfect. But when we put those in there, what happens is that now when a disappointment happens, you say, you know what? I remember I planned for this. Mm. I planned for this. So instead of me, I'm going to, and I'm going to take, and when I plan for this, I plan when a disappointment and when, when I'm feeling a little sad, and off my game, I remembered that this is the exercise that I have to do. So yes, mm. plan for disappointments. Because what mm. happens is it now becomes a stepping stone and not a mm. setback. 
Wow, wow, wow. There's so many nuggets in what you just said, because it's so interesting. I'm thinking about even my life and how many times I've allowed disappointment to be this huge surprise for me. And mm -hmm. then oftentimes I've said, why has this happened to me? But it's interesting if we were to plan for the disappointment. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do when yeah. I reach a disappointment? Yeah. It's interesting how yeah. you view disappointments really as, like you say, a stepping stone, something to be overcome, something, yes. a hurdle that you've already kind of exercised towards. Mm -hmm. um, so that's mm -hmm. just so powerful, so powerful. Yeah. Um, tell me, it's just such a wonderful exercise. When has that? When did you realize that you had to put that into practice in your life? When did you reach a disappointment where you knew, next time I need to plan for this and this is how I need to plan? Mm -hmm. So in, I, I guess I've always, I've, we all experience disappointment. And when it happens, it's, it catches us by surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and most recently, um, I had a disappointment that happened and I was very heartbroken and shattered. Um, however, I said, okay, my goal was to achieve this. Mm -hmm. How can I let that disappointment turn into energy mm -hmm. to propel me to still get to that goal? It might look, the avenue of getting there is going to be different. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to get there. Yeah. Um, and and th this is something I think it's not something that you necessarily it just doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. But even this is a work in progress. Right. I've I, I think I've learned that from maybe early on into my career. I've been doing this. Um, I've been at my practice where I work at right now for three years. Mm -hmm. And um, that was a learning curve. <laughs> and I, I think. <laughs> I think with that, with the learning curve, <coughs> excuse me, comes some adjustment and I've adjusted and throughout as every year progress, I've learned that I'm getting in tune with being a good therapist, being a good friend, being a good mother and being a good Christian. And we're going to table that part for a second. And what I started to do was every morning when I was, um, in, in the office at work, I would read my Bible every morning. Mm. And that would be my setup for what's to come in the day. And I found that doing that simple thing um, gave me so much inspiration for where my sessions would go. It was like, God is telling me who's coming through my door needs this information. And they might not be Christian, but I could, have, I could spin that even in a worldly way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if they were Christian, man, they got, they got the best, right. Mm -hmm. Of not just, yeah. not just from the emotional standpoint, but from the spiritual standpoint that they were leaving feeling like, Oh my goodness, I didn't expect for my, not just my mood to be improved, but for mm -hmm. me to look at God in the way that he is directing me to keep this mood going. Wow. So, you know, I, I, so I, I definitely believe it's, it's progression. Mm -hmm. um, and it's learning every day. I'm, I'm not opposed to that. This morning I, I, I woke up and last night I was feeling a little crappy and I spoke to one of my best friends and she's like, you got this girl. You need to get back to reading to your Bible in the morning. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And she's like, no, Renee, you got this. You got this. Why, why are you, um, why are you stepping off of your game? Why are you slowing down? You got, you're the Michael Jordan. I said, really? And she's like, yes. And I'm thinking to myself, you're right. And this morning I got up and I, I opened my Bible. I'm reading first Samuel. And I'm like, yes, I needed to hear this message mm -hmm. of being relentless at what you want. When Hannah just said, you know, I'm a pray. I'm a pray yes. to open my wound. So it, it just really correlated that I needed that opening for myself. Mm -hmm today so and and that and and that might be tomorrow's going to be something different once again 
feelings are not linear. Yeah. So many powerful things you said. One of the things that stuck with me is the fact that you fell on this morning, First Samuel, discussing the story of Hannah, who she mm -hmm. experienced disappointment after mm -hmm. disappointment, mm -hmm. um, and really just an example of how the effective prayers of the righteous availeth much. Yes. You know, it's yes. so interesting that yes. in the midst of that disappointment, she wanted a son, mm -hmm. but God wanted a prophet. Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes it takes a little longer when God has something bigger than your eyes can even fathom. Um, yeah. Your brain can even have the capacity to think that mm -hmm. we go have to go through these disappointments. But like you said, it builds our faith. Absolutely. And, look, and, her, and, and Hannah, her faith was built um, so that she was able to translate that into her son. And, and because of where she was and the experience that she had, and the Bible said her heart grieved, mm. right? When we're talking about grieving now, everyone, we're, I think we're all in this moment of grieving. Um, and what her heart was grieving, we're thinking, when we think about grieving, we think in regards to death. Mm. from the dsm says that grief is the acute pain that follows a loss mm. right the acute pain that follows the loss now listen diamond listeners i know you guys thought I i'm gonna do some mental health stuff too right but there's a word here <laughs> right yeah. the acute pain that follows a loss so that's 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 the definition and we're thinking well what is she losing? She is losing potential. Mm. And sometimes we have to grieve potential, the potential of what it is to be a mother, because what she has seen mm. was other mothers around mm. her. And, and her desire was that she knows like, Oh my gosh, God, if you let me have this, I'll be the best mother ever. And God is saying, you're not ready. I need you to grieve a little longer. Mm. I need you to grieve a little longer. That when it did happen, what, what happened? She was out and she was praying and she's, you know, the priest is like, what is this woman drunk? Is she drunk? Mm. And, and the Holy Spirit just infected her. Mm. And that prayer was God saying, okay, now you're ready. And the potential that you thought that you had is not even what you're about to get. It's way, be, it's bigger than just you because now I'm a part of this. And sometimes we need to let God be the potential and not let our own will and our own desires lead. Once God provides us with that, something happens that a change occurs and we go to places that we never thought we would have went so wow wow it's so interesting because talking about grief being acute pain after a loss mm -hmm. it really changes how i would even say my deepest condolences because now it's not just mourning there is an acute pain behind Mm -hmm. the morning and I think that's something that we tend to forget is mm -hmm. how much anguish and pain yeah. Yeah. the individual is going through with mm -hmm. a loss you yeah. know right now the COVID statistics we are at almost I think we're a little bit over 90,000 deaths in America and mm -hmm. many of those individuals may not have had the opportunity to go to their loved one's funeral yeah. due to the new restrictions, yeah. um, there has to be significant pain in that, mm -hmm. no actual closure mm -hmm. in that. Um, and, and, and a Diamond listener might be saying, you know, I hear you, Renee. I know that I need to bring God in this, but this thing hurt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can God mm -hmm. really be in the midst of this can God mm -hmm. really pull me through this yeah you know 
um, what are some ways to effectively grieve? Mm -hmm. There is no effectively, right? So mm -hmm. we look for effective ways. We look for, mm -hmm. we like to use those phrases, but mm -hmm. I say tailor the grieving process to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the therapeutic world, the five stages, denial, mm -hmm. anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And then I say, start all over again, <laughs> right? Because mm -hmm. wow. there's going to be moments where you've hit, and, and it's not a um, sequential it doesn't, it, these aren't things that happens in se sequence. It might, I might be angry today. I might be depressed tomorrow. I might accept, um, or I've accepted that the fact that this person is gone, mm -hmm. but I'm still hurting. So I say, Taylor, yeah. great to you. Um, don't feel bad for feeling sad. It is okay to sit in your sadness for a while. Um, I run a grieving group with my church and the common misconception that everyone states, you know, I think as Christians, we've been so rigid in regards to mm -hmm. grieving that um, true self is hindered and people say, well, you know, I've been talking to this person and they say, well, you are a Christian. You should not be grieving like that. You got to look to God. And that person now becomes angry mm. and they're saying, but God took me, took the, my loved one. There's not, there's no way that no one can really say there's appropriate thing to say an appropriate way to deal. Some people might fall back into maladaptive behaviors, which is unhealthy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is unhealthy. But if we could acknowledge that, listen, I am sad. I am sad and 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 no I've lost my 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 child my daughter my husband my sister my friend to covid and that looks different from you losing your your loved one on February 16th because what happens mm. was at that time grieving and mourning look differently we had family members that were able to visit and they you know we were from the caribbean they would bring a pot of food Absolutely. Right? They will bring a pot of food and people will sit and they're there to, to comfort those, right. those who are grieving and mourning the loss. March 16th, a month later, that looked a lot differently. It looked so different that individual were, individuals weren't even able to go say their last goodbye. Mm. Mm. So when we talk about bargaining and the questioning and the grieving process that might look different and say but I wonder if they were in pain I wonder if they were alone I wonder mm -hmm. if they were um taken down to the morgue and if they were clean all these different mm -hmm. questions start to you begin to ask yourself and ponder upon after COVID-19 when we're not there to hold our loved one's hand so it looks a lot differently um so but I definitely say tailor it to to you tailor it to your family, ask for support. And critical, it's okay to say to people, you know what, I don't wanna pray with you right now. It's okay to say, no, I'd rather be alone. alone. Mm -hmm. And I, I know for those who are listening that are, 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 um, are super duper gung-ho on always being um, perfect in the sight of God, this is perfection. This is what perfection looks like. When we can honestly say, you know what? I'm okay. I'm prayed out. Some people are prayed out because they probably have gotten 35 different calls and everyone wants to pray. And at this moment, you're like, but I'm angry with God. I'm angry with God. Cognitive dissonance says two emotions can coexist. So I can love him and still be angry. Wow. Wow. I can love him and still be angry. So, and that this is where a lot of people might be in this moment. And, and God is the God of understanding. 
our mm -hmm. favorite text as a kid was Jesus wept, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wept. absolutely. So he wept because his heart was grieving. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I definitely um, would advise people to tailor grief to, to, to themselves. Oh, wow. That's so powerful because I think right now we're in a season where we really have to be more transparent mm -hmm. than we've ever been before. Um, yeah. I don't know about you, but it, at times, um, even within church, it's been hard to be transparent because you really don't know who to be transparent with. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see or what would you hope to see um, from support systems, whether it's families, whether it's church families, um, whether it's the workplace, what kind of support do you think needs to be provided post COVID? Because we've all been through something that's been very different. I've heard my grandmother say that they haven't seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, or what would you hope to see as a support system post COVID? Yeah, I think it's a great time for us to really focus on our mental health and the conversation around mental health. And <clears throat> when we, we think of mental health, we think of mental disorders, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and mental health is saying that as important as my physical health is, I go every once a year, I have that physical, that, 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 what is it? Um, the yearly physical, right? Mm -hmm. So I go, I get my yearly physical and everything is good. Yeah. And I think people need to now advocate for their mental also and saying, mm -hmm. take advantage of what's on your, your insurance. A lot of people have, what, six, eight sessions a year. Some people have 23, some people have 36. Take advantage of those things. And, and this is coming from someone who I, I'm very non-biased, non-judgmental. Um, and once you're able to open up to to maybe a therapist, a mental health provider, you're, you're able to now tell your truth. You're able to communicate effectively. So I think from this, I want people to have the opportunity to communicate about what's really bothering them, mm -hmm. um, about hurting, mm -hmm. about not feeling well, being mentally drained. If we can have a a conversation and a community where we hold people up who are feeling this way, then what we'll see in the long run is people health, right? There, there's this thing called social determinants of health. And one of it is that is your mental health. Once we can see that happening, you're like, oh my gosh, blood pressure is under control. Mm -hmm. Our eating is becoming better because we have this confidence. We're able to tell the truth. We're more productive. So I think all of these things will start happening, but a conversation needs to occur. And that conversation needs to be very open and honest about how are you doing? And you can be able to say, I'm not that well. I'm not that well. And the person just listens without saying, you know what, girl, pray about it. Not saying that prayer isn't, you don't need to pray about those things, mm -hmm. but I just need, I need you to just listen to me and I need you to focus. Right. Because I mm -hmm. have to say, I haven't prayed about it. Right. This is a, this is just what I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you. I don't need a, I don't, I might not necessarily need an answer. I might just need an ear. 